Yeah, Community Matters here on Think Tech at the 12 noon block on a given Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel, and that's Craig Wagner. He's a lawyer, and he's going to talk about um, something proximate to what he talked about before, namely anti-vaxxers. Welcome to the show, Craig. Oh, thanks for having me, Jay. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, so let's review. I mean, what, what is an anti-vaxxer anyway, and what was the context in which you discussed it last time? Well, yeah, that was about three years ago. And I think that uh, I, I'm glad you raised that because at the time I came on and gave what I felt was a relatively impassioned plea uh, for parents and, and, and those that had, had called themselves or put themselves in the camp of anti-vaxxers to reconsider the decision uh, not to vaccinate their kids with, among other things, the MMR vaccine and such. Uh, in, in, a, in a large part because of what I what I was seeing was a misinformation campaign. Uh, you know, I, I, I had pointed out that uh, you know the MMR vaccine and a lot of the other standard vaccines, uh, you know, had been used for many years, were very well tested, and you had this this, and, and still you had these you know the star power of celebrities like uh, Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey and others coming out, pointing back to pseudoscience that, you know, from a guy, Andrew Wakefield, who claimed that there was a link between that and, and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and autism. That was debunked. I mean, Andrew Wakefield lost his medical license. I mean, that, that all of these things were out there and yet the rumors persisted. And I felt that, um, you know, as a husband of a pediatrician and with so many in the medical field in my family, this was something that I, I felt relatively strongly about, and uh, you know, certainly we vaccinate our two boys, and and um, feel that uh, that this is a you know this kind of information was not getting out the way it could, and and I wanted to be a part of helping to to set that straight. I, you know, yeah, but it, it teaches us something. It's it, it not only about um, you know medicine and about vaccinations. It teaches us about people who provide misinformation, disinformation, uh, and use social media. Uh, because not only do they reach, you know, an audience, um, maybe a gullible audience uh, at a given point in time, an audience looking, you know, for looking for distortions and conspiracy theories and that sort of thing, an audience that wants to have a different view than, you know, common uh, common sense, um, and those systems find people, and, and what I find most interesting, and we're seeing this play out in the, in the Trump world. Uh, is not only do people accept that, but even when it's debunked, they continue to accept it. I find this a flaw in our, in our world, actually. But, but what you were describing in connection with measles is happening again. It's really surprising in the time of COVID. So can you talk about the emergence of a, an anti-vaccination mentality in, in today's time of COVID? Well, I mean, I can try to. I mean, let me start with, with with saying first of all that I, you know, I am not a doctor. I mean, I'm a doctor in the way that you know, Dr. Pepper is a doctor. So, I, I'm really not... <laughs> you may never, you may never be left, uh, you know, alone on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no medical training. I have no basis, um, you know, other than, you know, my my interest in the subject and, you know, my my desire to help try to debunk some of the misinformation that has been spread at times regarding, you know, vaccination. And, you know, as we talked about, in, in particular, my interest at the time three years ago was, you know, our, our standardized testing, uh, I mean, our standardized vaccinations for our kids. Um, we're in a different world now with COVID-19. And, and, and I think that, you know, only in the last week or so, you know, the, uh, the National Health Institute came out with a, a study saying that it looked like a, a third of Americans might not even accept and, and, and get themselves and their kids and such vaccinated with a, a COVID-19 vaccination, even if it were readily available at a low cost. And that sort of surprised a lot of people. And, but it doesn't necessarily surprise me. And, and, and you'd want to point at that and say, these are all anti-vaxxers. And it's not that they're just that these are anti-vaxxers and we can lump them in the same group of the people that were listening to Jenny McCarthy or uh, other celebrities um, and, and, and trying to find links to, uh, you know, potential side effects and such that weren't there. It's that we're dealing with something right now that's happening in real time. And, 
you know, the concern, of course, is always going to be misinformation. But we're concerned about misinformation now on both sides. I mean, there is a true legitimate concern, I believe, that all of us are rushing to a vaccine. We need that, okay, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I mean, even the name of the operation, it's, it's Operation Warp Speed. I mean, we're trying to do this as absolutely fast as possible. And to go in and, and do that, uh, you know, from a medical standpoint and to get through the three levels of FDA testing uh, takes time. I mean, usually it's taking years. So there is a concern that this rush and the need and the political pressure and everything else that's going into this or result in insufficient testing. And we could end up with, could we end up with a, a cure that's worse than the disease or that at least have side effects that over time we discover that are as bad or worse than the disease. So this leaves a big question is when they emerge now, uh, the, the new anti-vaxxers, the COVID anti-vaxxers, um, are they talking about an incomplete, you know, uh, a premature vaccine? That's what troubles them? Or is it beyond that? Is, is it that and other things? Any idea what drives them? Well, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily have my finger on the pulse of, uh, of that, other than to say that, I, you know, based on articles and other things that I've been seeing, and I expect that others are seeing, you sort of have a, a, a number of different groups, and perhaps it's even a, 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 you know, a, a gradient. But we do have some that are out there that are, are just rabid anti-vaccination uh, as a matter of, of political stance and such, and that as a result, they're, they're spreading, or at least some of them are spreading misinformation. I mean, things like all the, you know, the vaccinations that are being developed are using monkey brains or this is all a CIA plot for mind control and uh, you, know, you shouldn't take it because of that. I mean, th this is just simple misinformation. It's, it's just not true. And so you know, spreading lies or misinformation like that as a method of fear mongering is not a good platform for discussion of what I think are maybe some legitimate concerns about how we're going to deal with vaccinations as they come out and how comfortable we are that they are safe. I think, you know, a lot of this, uh, forgive me for crossing into politics for a minute. Uh, a lot of this comes from credibility issues with the government. Um, you know, for example, if, you know, Trump has been giving us misinformation and disinformation about this for his own political purposes uh, since, since it started. Um, and uh, you know, when he says warp speed, you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> that really appeals to somebody who has no idea about the science. It appeals to somebody who is interested in speed beyond accuracy. Um, and it is, it is, it is a, a dog whistle uh, for people who want to rush into things. At the same time, you know, I get a mixed message from him. I'm not sure what he wants to do. I'm not, and I think there's a lot of people out there who take that real seriously. Uh, they're not sure what he wants to do. I mean, the other day he was talking about um, herd, uh, herd mentality, otherwise known as herd immunity. Um, so which way are we going here? And I think that kind of confusion that this administration has put, put on it by not respecting the science, by not allowing the scientists to you know, make the decisions and, and make the public statements um, creates the kind of confusion that is fertile ground um, for anti-vaxxers to move in with conspiracy theories and, and adopt outlandish, uh, outlandish, um, you know, positions. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I think that that is, um, you know, that, that's working against science in a sense. And, and we really need to let the science um, run this and, uh, and, and not turn it into a political tool either for you know, the, the current administration or, or, or whatever is going to come. I, I think that one of the concerns I have, I mean, anytime you're talking about a vaccination um, and, and the testing and, and what, it, what it's going through, you're really looking at two different things. One is um, to determine, is it effective? Is it actually going to vaccinate people and protect against the disease? And, and how effective is that? And the second part is, um, is it, are there other side effects? Are there other things that we are not seeing that as a result of that, we're going to end up with a cure 
for the disease, but a whole other problem. Um, for example, I mean, you take vaccination and we find out a year from now that it destroys your liver. I'm not saying it's going to destroy your liver. I have no evidence of that whatsoever. So don't read that into this. But what I'm saying is that any time that we're putting medication in our body for the purposes of, of, of vaccinating against things, there are potential side effects. Okay? Yeah. Let me and go a step. Let me go a step further. Um, you know, we are all walking laboratories these days because we take a lot of other drugs. Forget about, you know, vaccine for a moment. We take tons of drugs, you know, you, you, you fill your hand with all the pills you take and, and your hand is heavy with all those pills, the older you get, right? And we don't know whether another pill, one more pill or a vaccine will interact with the cocktail, the combination of all the pills you're otherwise taking because we're on warp speed. We haven't checked it out. I just wanted to add that. Oh, I think you make a good point, which is, uh, it, it, it is that just because um, we've developed it, we've determined that in testing in humans that are not taking other medications, uh, we have not found any types of interactions that would, would cause serious side effects doesn't mean that, that those on other medications or those with other conditions could not find those, uh, you know, bad side effects uh, or other things exacerbated as a result of, of taking the vaccination. And that's one of the reasons that typically the testing period uh, for new vaccinations and new drugs is as long as it is. Um, and so when vaccinations or new drugs come out, they come out with all kinds of recommendations and uh, and advice to doctors in terms of what to be looking for and what you shouldn't be mixing it with. <laughs> and yeah. um, the concern is that things are gonna happen so fast here that we're just gonna be rushing to vaccinate everybody without uh, sufficient you know, uh, checking into that and without sufficient uh, advice and, and such to both doctors and patients that the potential for that, uh, th those kind of side effects and those kind of problems uh, is increased. Yeah, well, you start out with me right now, snapshot, we have a certain substantial percentage of people that, that would say on a survey they're reluctant to take the, uh, you know, the vaccine for whatever vaccine for whatever reason. And they're going to resist it. They're going to say, look, you know, I, I, um, I, I don't go to the shopping center. I wear a mask every day. I'm very careful. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be careful about the vaccine. That's not an, that's not an unreasonable position to take because they don't, they don't really cotton to warp speed, okay? So they're resisting. Then, of course, there's a kind that go for the conspiracy theories and they're little nutcakes. Uh, they're all the wrong reasons, uh, but they're also going to be resistant. Okay, full stop right there. Then we begin the vaccine, which may not have been fully, you know, trialed. Um, and then, of course, there's something in the newspaper or on MSNBC or even Fox News that says somebody just died from some, may I use the term, pre-existing condition, okay? And the interaction between the vaccine and the condition or whatever it was, you know, it's, it's, it's attributable to something untested in the vaccine, okay? And this is on front page, or better yet, this is on social media. And it gets out there and the message is, if you weren't worried before, it's time to get worried now. So instead of having, I forget what you said, a third of the people uh, concerned and maybe a little paranoid about vaccines the way it is or appears to be now, if that happens, and it may very well happen, it's, it's a raw meat news story, uh, we may find that that goes up to 50%, 60%, who knows where that goes, and everybody is terrified of taking the vaccine. Now you got a real problem. I, absolutely, and and that's a given. Um, anytime that you're talking about introducing a new medication, whether it's a vaccination or others, into the market, you're going to deal with the issue of what I'm going to refer to as outliers, which are, are are people that just because of their physical makeup or or uh, you know the, their body or whatever, they don't react the way that everyone else does uh, or that you know, the majority of people do to uh, what they're, what's being put in their body. Um, and it, it could be as severe as death. It could be other, uh, you know, organ failure. It could be any, any manner of other affliction. And 
I guess the challenge and the problem with that is that that creates some significant fear and it's going to happen. I mean, if you're going to introduce this and start, you know, trying to vaccinate millions of people or hundreds of thousands and then millions of people, some people are not going to handle that well, just like some people are allergic to peanuts and some people are, are, are have other allergies and, and other things that that's going to be one that uh, uh, is always going to be, uh, you know, a, scaring people and you're going to see the news catch on to that and social media catch on to that and point to that uh, and it's going to it, it's going to raise uh, the same anti-vaccination uh, concerns and fears and voices that we see for vaccinations that have been around for a very long time have been well tested and have been demonstrated not to have much in the way of uh, side effects but there's always going to be the outliers yeah, and what I see happening in that event, which is a, a fair possibility, really, uh, is we have a crisis, another bigger crisis of confidence in the Rose Garden, um, you know, where the president, whoever it may be, is trying to allay these fears and concerns um, and, you know, query whether people are going to accept that. It's a credibility issue. The, the, other, the other thing is that, you, you know, you really can't have an effective epidemiological reaction to a vaccine unless you vaccinate X percent of the population. Uh, I, I don't know what that might be, but it's, it's up to 60, 70 percent. Only that way can you have kind of the mirror image reflection of herd immunity. In other words, there's so few people left to get infected that, that the, the thing is suppressed. Um, and that's, the, that's public health, that's epidemiology. Well, if nobody is taking it because they're all terrified, uh, we don't achieve that. And, th and then the pandemic goes on longer. And you may be able to protect yourself, even assuming it's an, you know, it's a, it's a, an effective vaccine, but the population in general is at greater risk than, than it should be. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and that isn't the, the mirror of it. That is herd immunity. And, and herd immunity is different depending on the, uh, the vaccine and the disease. Uh, and so the, the amount of, uh, you know, the number of people or the percentage of our, our population that would need to actually take the disease, the, the vaccination and, and be immune. Now, they may also be immune because they already had it. Uh, so we have that group as well. But you're absolutely correct that, that the issue is going to be, do we get to a point where uh, the, the uh, COVID-19 can't get a foothold because there's sufficient uh, immunity, uh, either by vaccination or by those that have had it, so that you know one person got it, it just doesn't spread. And that's going to be a significant number. And a third of the people do not take it. I, I, I believe you, you will not reach the herd immunity, at least not for a very long time. Uh, because those people that aren't taking it will eventually uh, possibly get it and then, and then they'll be immune because of that. that that is a big issue and by the way herd immunity and um and and herd mentality are, are two completely different things <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> you ought to send a short email to the white house to try to never mind yeah. um, so, <laughs> so the other thing the other thing it strikes me um is that you know it's not it's not just one vaccine out there um, you know, this government is, uh, you know, appealing to encouraging funding multiple vaccine, um, you know, uh, pharma companies uh, to do multiple approaches on it, uh, simply not all the same. And, and I'm just a point of logic. If they're not all the same, let me say some will be better than others. If they're not all the same, one will be the best one you want to take. And, and somebody is going to have to get up in the Rose Garden or from the task force, if there still is a task force, and tell us which one. And the problem is that that, that advice uh, could be politicized, uh, weaponized even. Um, that advice could be wrong. Um, and instead of taking the right one, we take a lesser one because of political reasons or greed, you know, or mm, dividends to shareholder kind of reasons uh, or mm, relations with with public official reasons. And the CDC has already lost its, uh, the bloom on its rose. So who do you believe? Which one do you take? And further, I want to add one more thing, is that there are research, uh, research companies, pharma companies, um, developing vaccines in China. We haven't heard much about that because we've been busy criticizing them. Uh, and in Europe, 
Um, Trump tried to acquire a uh, pharma company in Europe who was working on a vaccine. He offered him a billion dollars. I'm not sure if that was your money or mine. He offered him a billion dollars to sell their intellectual property and sell their scientists um, into the United States. And they said, no. Angela Merkel said, uh, no, we're going to do it ourselves. But, but the point is, there's lots of valuable research going on overseas. And you know, the news I read tells me that there is not the level, the ideal level of uh, collaboration going uh, because we've nationalized the, you know, the, the effort. Well, if that happens, let me throw this at you. If that happens, we're not only going to have a bunch of vaccines here, some of which will be better than others, we're going to have a bunch of vaccines globally, some of which will be better than others. And if you follow the nationalistic approach on this, we won't be able to get the one from Germany. Uh, we won't be able to get the one from, from China. So we're going to have a sort of a, a subset of uh, vaccines that may not even be the best right here. And then the risk that I was talking about before, the risk that it doesn't work and everybody loses confidence and you know, when we turn into a bunch of, a nation of anti-vaxxers, if you will, um, you know, is, is a higher risk. Meanwhile, Europe and Asia do better. How about that for a creepy possibility, Craig? Well, that, that is a creepy possibility. I think there are a number of concerns there. Uh, and not the least of which is the fact that, uh, you know, developing the vaccine, uh, getting through the testing, finishing level three and, and having confidence that we've created a vaccine that is both effective and is not going to be a, a cure worse than the, than the disease uh, is a challenge in and of itself. Taking the next step, and that is to take this vaccine then and mass produce it and then mass distribute it, to have it available and to have it available at a cost that the populace can afford, particularly at this time, is a whole other challenge. And the, the temptation is going to be to do that with the first one we can get and get it out on the market. And it, it, once that happens, that sort of by default becomes the vaccine for it. Um, it's going to be very hard to get others out there. And, and then how do you, I mean, how does the, the regular, you know, Joe American, Jane American, make any kind of distinction between these different vaccines and their effectiveness, and you're correct. It could be political, it could be financial, uh, you know, it could be uh, almost nationalistic. Uh, and you know, we have different testing through the FDA and other requirements uh, here than they have in Europe and that they have in, in, in China and in other, other countries. And you know, the fear is gonna be, uh, you know, if one appears to be better coming from Europe, are we comfortable that that is, uh, has been thoroughly vetted, particularly with respect to not just its ability to uh, vaccinate against COVID-19, but also with respect to potential side effects um, and interactions. So th there are a lot of issues that come up with this, and I don't have any answers for those. Um, you know, not that I would, but I, I think that these are the kind of issues that science and our scientists, our epidemiologists and others need to be very frank and, 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 uh, and in discussing with the American public. And we need to get it out of the, the, the political discourse. That, that just is not helping. Yeah, God, I have a, I have a vision of a um, bootleg vaccine coming from Europe, you know. United States government, uh, the uh, you know customs uh, department, customs service, um, doesn't want to let it in for obviously political reasons, not medical reasons, and but they pretend it's medical reasons. We can't get it, and then there are people who sell it to you for big bucks because you know it is found to be uh, effective in Europe. Anyway, passing that, the big question here is: What does the individual do? What do you do for your family? I mean, you want to save, every, you want to save all the people around you. Uh, money is actually no object. You don't want them sick. You don't want them spreading it among themselves or others close to them. So what, what do we do at this point? Because I think soon enough, some maybe half-baked vaccine will be on the market. Um, what does the individual do to, to get to, to take the right one uh, to um, you know, have the benefit of it? 
Well, I, you know, that's a fair question and, uh, and one that I, I don't have a perfect answer for on a, on a personal level. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the science. Uh, I'm going to be looking at what, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci and others, uh, I'm going to look at the FDA, I'm going to look at the CDC, I'm going to look at others and say, if they're standing behind it, then I, I am going to be, you know, prepared for myself and my family to, to, to be vaccinated against COVID-19 as an effort, not just to help protect us, but to help protect our community. Um, but is there a risk in that? And uh, you know, the hard part for me to say is, you know, given my impassioned plea previously about vaccinations, it would almost seem contradictory. But in this case, I think that there are reasons why people would have hesitancy and concerns. And that's fair. Uh, but, you know, at some point, we're going to have to trust that our scientists are doing the best that they can and that uh, we need to move. Um, and uh, so that, I think that's where I fall out on it. Uh, but I, it, it does worry me. If I was finding a, a takeaway from this discussion, it would be, you know, you, you really have to be careful who you trust. Um, a given president would stand in the Rose Garden and um, it has been shown that in this administration, he's not the guy you want to trust. Another president would be more trustworthy, I think. And uh, CDC has to rebuild its reputation before I'm going to trust them. Um, and at the end of the day, as you said, just as you said, Craig, you got to follow it. You got to follow the science. And I have one last question for you. So do you take it on day one or do you take it 60, 90 days after it comes out? When do you take it? Well, I think once it becomes available, uh, I'm going to have to believe that the testing has been completed. I don't believe 60 or 90 days is going to tell us very much about uh, you know, side effects or other things that haven't already been determined and, and uh, examined within the context of the level three testing. I'm, I'm more concerned, you know, the long-term effects. Um, and, you know, you're going to be waiting years before you're going to really know that. Yeah. Craig, very valuable conversation. A whole new look at things, I would say. This, this issue has not been discussed in, in, the, in the public uh, conversation. And I, I really appreciate your coming down and uh, although you, you're not up to the standard of Dr. Pepper, um, I never thought Dr. Pepper knew much about this anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, you made valuable contributions today to the public conversation on the issue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha.